everybody. Uh, thank you, Charles. Thank you, Beijing Film Academy, for having all of us. This is really a uh, good event. Like Chris said, he spoke three years ago. I've been coming to Beijing Film Academy and uh, talking for almost four years, over four years now. So it's been really cool to see more and more people come out, more international, really talented people come. Um, so thank you, BFA. This is a good event. All right, so the, the subject for the day, or the subject for at least this session, is called workflow innovation. Like, I'm not gonna talk about too much technology. It's pretty cool to follow Chris. Like, their stuff is amazing. So what I'm gonna talk about, because I work on films here, so I'm actually doing Chinese films. So I wanna talk more, it's a pretty good segue coming after third floor, because I wanna talk about how do we get the stuff that he just showed us? Like, how do we actually use that stuff on our films in China? So I want to talk more about like what goes on in Chinese films, how I see you know, the process or what the market's like, how we can actually do stuff together to improve the market. So I'm not going to talk about technology innovation. I'm going to talk more about the market and how I see the environment of filmmaking in China, and particularly when we have really difficult challenges, how we go out to the experts from international communities, and how do we really, really, really use their skill sets to work on our films. So, let me see, did that work? Yeah. So, just a little bit about me. I come from, it's like 20 some years in VFX. So I worked in Hollywood films, worked on like Harry Potters and things. Uh, I worked on a few films in China where I came here and shot, and I got really interested in the market probably nine, eight, nine years ago, and then I moved here full time four years ago. And the idea was like a lot of people to come develop Chinese films that you know we're going to make a film and it's going to you know we're going to show it in China and it's going to be shown in North America. We're going to do a co-production. And that's a very difficult thing, and my experience is VFX, so the filmmakers started to talk with me more often about, can I help them with VFX? So it became really apparent that there was a real need for VFX knowledge, sort of VFX know-how in this market. So I really enjoyed what they were doing, I liked talking with them, so I packed up and I moved here, and I've been fortunate enough to work with some great filmmakers on some good projects and some, some not so good projects. Um, so some of you will know uh, League of Gods, Feng Shambang, like kind of everybody hated that movie, but I think we did pretty good on the VFX. So I'll, during my talk today, I'll talk about that a little bit, some kind of lessons that I learned personally from working on Feng Shambang. Um, and some of the things that it says about the, the market here. All right, so everyone kind of knows these things, but the, the market here is booming, you know, except for this year, which I can go into in a bit, the market's growing like 50% in the box office. So, you know, we make 600 films a year. We, you know, we're, we're producing tons of work. There's international news sites, everyone in Hollywood. There was just like a Chinese uh, Hollywood film festival thing with lots of announcements. You go to the Shanghai Film Festival, you go to the Beijing Film Festival, everybody's announcing slates of deals. Like it's all tons of stuff going on. Like we all know that that's happening. I like this bottom quote, you know, the Chinese filmmakers are smart and understand storytelling. It's very true, it's very true. Like some of the filmmakers are fantastic here. But what's happening is I don't think they understand the big toys like VFX and technology and things. So you have some really good storytellers who exist in the markets for many for this market for many years and they make fantastic movies. But all of a sudden you throw something as complicated as visual effects into the mix and it becomes harder for everybody. They all of a sudden feel they have to change their filmmaking style or they don't want to change their filmmaking style, but it becomes a more complicated issue for everyone. And they want to do the VFX films because the market's really demanding it. The Chinese film market, they like VFX films. Everybody's into the big spectacle films from Hollywood, even the Chinese fantasy films with a lot of VFX are traditionally doing good. So the spectacle is desired, like the market is demanding this kind of work. So there's good filmmakers, 
there's a demand for the highly technical work, like VFX work, but putting those two together becomes quite a difficult matter. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you have a booming market and what is the reality is it's really, uh, I'm gonna use the word, okay. I mean, it's really hard, like it's very difficult. Like, I know a lot of you guys are students, and I know there's a lot of business people here, and there's some technicians and things, but making films in China is incredibly difficult. So that's not great, but it's not a terribly bad thing, because there's also, even Chris alluded to it, there's like a lot of passion, and there's a lot of people really caring, and they want to do well, so the opportunities are good. So I'll just go into a little bit. My take is you have this booming market, and everybody, not everybody, but the financiers, the people who are actually paying the bills, they want to monetize off of this booming market. So there's a lot of people investing. There's a lot of talk, there's a lot of money. So what happens is decisions, I don't want to say greed, but I will say greed. They, they, they make decisions based on money, and it's not like with bad intent, but they're decisions that impact how the quality of the work can happen. So, you know, things like schedules, you know, the, the, I'll go back to Feng Shen Bong. So for instance, I know there's a lot of foreign, foreigners in here who, who know some of the numbers and things. There's like 2,200 VFX shots and 15 non-VFX shots and like not many low fruit. There were really complicated, complicated works. We did those 2,200 shots in like five months. It's kind of unheard of in the West. And I think the quality was good. Like again, people weren't happy with the movies, but somewhere along the lines, we made a decision to put the movie on screens at a certain release date, like a certain real estate uh, that we needed to get the movie out. And that caused a lot of editorial decisions, a lot of decisions of how to execute, and it dramatically impacted the final result of that film. So it was just a decision that happened because of business things, and it impacted what we do. And that happens a lot here. So. Things like budgets and tight schedules, you know, are really a byproduct of a market that's demanding more financially. So these are some of the bad things. I'll get into positive stuff later. All right, so uh, you also end up working with a lot of inexperienced producers and inexperienced everyone. If you're making 600 movies a year and not all of those are going on screens, there's a dilution of talent. So you know, producers especially, there's a lot more, there's a lot more work being financed and people doing the work than there are people to do it. So it starts at the producer level, it goes to the VFX people, it goes to the directors, it goes to the DPs, it goes to everything. There's not enough people to go around. So in a glut market, there's just too much, too much to do and it's hard to assemble the teams. So it's another very difficult thing in the market. I think some of this is like, I think I'm just kind of recapping the market. If you're new in the market, you may know this. If you're international, it may be good information for you. So I'm just kind of recapping how I feel the market is and talk a little bit about, a little bit about how we can help or what we can do to, to improve it. Okay, so Chris was kind of alluding to it. I keep, I keep calling back to him, but his, the lack of organization and understanding, there's, there's, there's a lot of, in a VFX complicated film, you don't need to go too far, but the things like pre -vis, the things like uh, some of the tech -vis, the elements that he was talking about with the pipeline as far as how the data flows and how information is organized for a filmmaker, that is organization, that is process, those are systems. We don't have that here. Like we just don't have a lot of systems in filmmaking. We have we have people who can go out and they can do really like drama heavy films. But when I'm talking, I'm you know I'm really discussing sort of VFX heavier spectacle films. And you know I know the audience as well. Like you see it on Weixin and like you know a, a lot of the people talking in friend circles and things. And the market is in this place where it's demanding better quality. Like, it's a great thing, but it's demanding better quality. And 
they do like the spectacle, but there's almost like a backlash where people are actually saying they don't, you know, there's too much spectacle, there's too much spectacle, you know, there's not enough Guanxi relationships building in the, the, the storytelling, but there's always room for both. There's always room for good story in a very original world and the conflict from the world driving better relationships, putting harder pressures on the character. So some of the more successful spectacle films in the West they have this balance between heavy spectacle and story. That's usually when they're successful. There's some, obviously, big VFX films that don't. They have, like, mostly spectacle, but the, 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 more, the more successful ones do. Um, the other thing about the Chinese market is you make a movie in China, you're given a budget, you go through the time period, you get distribution, it goes on screens, you may be competing against the Hollywood films, and those budgets will be much higher. You know, they have other ways of recouping their budget with North America box office, with IP exploitation like toys and all kinds of different ways, TV spin-offs, video games, etc. But the IP exploitation in China isn't as well defined either. So what you're having is these budgets that to make money off of a film, you have to recoup it in the local market. So our budgets, until a Chinese film can make it in North America or Europe or can somehow exploit merchandising, our budgets are gonna be much less. So we have to go up against Gravity, we have to go up against The Martian, we have to go up against Avatar, but we do not have those budgets. So it goes back to the questions of Okay, we don't have it, we never will, we can't complain about it, but what are we going to do to try to inch towards that? The Western films or the technologies? How do we actually take advantage of expertise and knowledge and technology that they have already evolved in the West on some of the bigger films? All right, so again there's like this organization system the idea that there's a hub of a movie whether that's previs or whoever the team is however you call it there is this idea that there's a centralized place to take care of the technology needs right now like it's getting better in china but you know like even a couple years ago like i'm talking the majority of the movie are like USB drives and people like, you know, running around and handing off USB drives to, to different computers. So there's a lot of room for improvement and we're getting there. Like we're starting to see things like databases installed in a central server for a production and organizing the information. Those are some of the basic things that really, it's not like we have to go out and find a company like Bot and Dolly and, you know, try to develop some crazy uh, new technology for uh, per pulling off a, a effect. It's a simple thing of going, okay, we're gonna make this film, we're gonna make the next film, we're gonna make the next film, we're probably doing the same thing every time. What can we do to organize it? So a lot of this is just in mentality of students out there and you guys, as you come into the market and start to you know, expand your know-how, this is one of the first places to start. So, you know, this isn't about infringing on filmmakers or anything or trying to revolutionize the market. It's just a mindset of trying to organize stuff a little bit. All right, so the other thing is thinking long-term. Again, for me in the market, like I'm here for the market, that's why. Like, I think there's a lot of people from the West, they come very project-driven. And again, there's like kind of money. They got this idea and they want to do this film and they see money in China and they come to China and they're trying to get their film financed, et cetera. So my experience in that is those relationships don't usually work out that well. So you need to find it in yourself. You can't just say it, it has to be true. And I'll get into later some of why I really like it here. But I think you need to find something to help the market. Like you have to try to find something to help make the quality better, to hopefully 
make audiences happy with the films that they're seeing, because that's what we do, is we put something on a screen in front of people, and either they like it or they don't. And like, in a crazy market like this, it's amazing how many meetings I sit on, and it feels like we've all just forgotten that we're making a movie, and this movie's gonna last forever, and people are gonna see it, it's gonna impact kids, they're gonna talk about it, like we forget that. So always need to think long term that these things are bigger than ourselves and there is stuff we need to do to try to improve. All right, so we have this technology, like Chris is a perfect example. I'm fortunate enough, like he's working on a film of ours now and hopefully some more films. Uh, but how can we bridge the gap? How do we get people, companies here with the budgets? This is half like I'm asking everybody, half I'm trying, I have my own ideas and I'm trying to do it, but the budgets are tight and we have hard problems. So what we do constantly is trying to find the right people. It's like casting. If you have a specific need for an actor, you don't go out and get the cheap actor or you don't go out and get the wrong actor. You find the right actor for the role. The same thing goes for technology. So if you have something as complicated as like a CG character that needs to be the lead of your film, if somebody here or Korea or even Europe can't do it, if you really want to solve the problem for a quality base, maybe for that problem you have to go to the experienced people in the world first. So my experience is a lot of the Chinese filmmakers, some of it is language and stuff, but they don't exert themselves to the rest of the world. They don't necessarily always find the, the right people for the problem. They assume they don't have enough budget. They assume these different things. But I think everyone should be more open to going, okay, I really think these guys are the best way to solve the problem and contact them and try to figure out ways to make it work. So like a lot of research, you know, there's just pragmatic advice is really try to be knowledgeable about who does what and who does what good. Obviously, third floor with the previs, there's like companies that just do character stuff well, there's companies like Framestore that do fantastic stuff. Start to know technology-wise, Bot and Dolly with the robots is awesome, but Google bought them so you can't get them on anymore, unfortunately. So there's like different options out there, so do your research and don't be afraid to, to contact people. Um, and then it's like, you need to, to work on ways to try to bridge the communication gap. So <laughs> there's always difficulties, just you know, the simple things between China and not China is language, obviously, and then there's different cultural, there's different business methods, things like that. But I think it's like an open mind. You know, a lot of I think what I'll get to as I go through the speech is really try to engage each other try to trust, come from a standpoint of trust, and try to work through things with the betterment of the project, the quality of the project in mind. Um, another issue is the continuity thing. So again, there was like uh, kind of the pipeline stuff from pre-production through production into post. Uh, I think the, uh, the, in China probably is partly it's probably partly the, the big uh, market thing again as well. It's, uh, if, if I'm a cinematographer or something, or if I'm a camera, if I'm a focus puller or something, one job, and somebody offers me a chance to DP, like it's difficult to make that decision to not go do it. But, you know, in North America, or, you know, in some places in Europe, you might have generations of focus pullers, you know what I mean? There's like people that grow up to do that job. And in China, that kind of just doesn't happen. So some of this is a call to people in the industry uh, that what we do is a craft and it takes time. Sometimes I'm amazed. I know the temptation, but sometimes I'm amazed with the speed that individuals demand the, the, their raising of their level based on you know, what they did on one project or based on the rest of the market. Oh. So this is an integrity question. It's really like, this is hard stuff that we do and it's not about being called a producer or being called a director or being called a VFX supervisor. It's really a process of learning how to do that, and it's more the path, it's not really the end goal. So if you have 
you know, the credit of directing, maybe you get paid money, you know, maybe, maybe you'll receive accolades, you know, you might gain something out of it. But really, it's the act of doing it. And again, if more people in the market can think like that, I think the quality will go up as well. These, these kind of things really don't cost any money. You know, This is all about treating film with the respect it deserves and what we do. So you get lured away and crews change and everything. If I'm working on a film, like I try my best to absolutely have the same crew from the very beginning to the very end. There's so much. Like you, you work at a company and you're CEO of a company and you lose an uh, employee and you have to bring in a new employee and retrain them and stuff. It's the same thing on a project, except like there's so much knowledge and all the mistakes that you did in pre-production and all the times the director said no, you know, that's not right, that's the wrong tone. All those things get forgotten. All the mistakes get forgotten. You can't replace that. So if you're producing your own films or if you're an individual, try to see things through and try to set up a system that you can keep the team or you encourage teams to stay for different reasons. Okay, so a little more detail in uh, like the, the differences between the East and West or how to make it work a little bit better. The obvious surface reason is Communication, the language, and then the access. There's like a distance. Um, so those are obvious. I think communication is one of the biggest things in filmmaking. So don't skimp on translation stuff. If you're a Westerner here and you're trying to do business, get a translator that knows the, the market you're in, knows the technical terms. If you're Chinese and you're trying to hire a Western, try Western or try or Western company, try to find people to translate, spend money, spend, spend resources on trying to make this relationship work. It's very hard. Like it's really incredibly difficult for uh, international talent or an international company to actually come in and participate in projects here. So to make them work, it takes extra effort, it takes uh, extra energy to, to actually make it work. All right, so one of the, the biggest, I've talked a little bit about it with other people today, but one of the biggest um, differences I feel, particularly in VFX, but I think it goes into everything, is in China, about four or five years ago, there was, Absolutely, it was like a flat bid world. So it was like a company would go, you would you throw it on a screenplay and you just say flat bid, like we'll do whatever you want, million RMB, forget it, we're yours, we'll do it. So the, it obviously gets more complicated, work gets attached on, but somebody's gotta do that work within that money. The company suffers, the quality suffers, but that's the business model. In the West, in VFX, it's shop-based, it's asset-based, you do a laundry list, you set things in a contract, you say how much it is, and many good VFX companies are out of business. So I'm not saying that that's the right solution, but there's something in the chaos of a new market that we are in in China that maybe there's new ways to look at the business models. So, like, again, there's, if I'm trying to deal with a, a Western company, I try to, like, put everything out on the table that we have. We have this much work, you know, there's all this stuff. We have this much budget, that's what we got. The idea is, you know, what, how can we do this? Like, how can we actually do the budgeting and what can we do, different levels of quality, different time frames? How do you want to work? So the business model in China to solve the problem of the high expectations with the low budgets it takes everybody to figure it out. And I think the more we work together with our partners on the films, the better we're gonna be able to deal with things like, you know, how do we charge? So uh, to me, there's an opportunity. Like, I think probably Western companies doing business here will learn things about business models and probably get very efficient. The, the speed that we do stuff is not optimal here, but actually we do some pretty good stuff in short time frames and, and not that big a budget. So I think there's things for everybody to learn. Um, all right, and then one of the big things that's really interesting to me, like Feng Shambang, obviously, League of Gods, one of the biggest issues was culturally, people just knew it wasn't, too chi it wasn't Chinese enough. So the audience really revolted about the storytelling and the culture 
uh, and what we did to a very famous Chinese mythology. So I learned a lot. Like, you know, I was doing the VFX on it, and, you know, everybody, production designer, director, we made decisions as a team. Like, you know, everybody who worked on that, it's our fault. But like we didn't, we didn't respect the Chinese audience. We weren't thinking about that. We were thinking cool and big, and this set piece is gonna be awesome. This set piece is gonna be awesome. We forgot about the whole. So this impacted me a lot. So you know, I feel responsible for it. So like I'm doing a lot of research myself. And if you go out and look on YouTube or Yuku, and you start to search for cultural differences between East and West. There's some fascinating stuff. There's one guy, like I'll just give one story because it's pretty cool. There's one guy, he's Berkeley, and now he's a professor at Tsinghua, and they've done a bunch of stories. And the fundamental concept is that the you go back in the West to Aristotle and Plato, and it's the individual, it's the I. And you go back to Confucianism and like, you know, Buddha, and it's harmony. And there's a difference there. And then that's got me thinking, it's like, well, that makes a lot of sense actually with my interactions with people here. But storytelling, what does that mean? You know, like all of a sudden, it's not about the I, you know, shit, we've been telling stories. It's like Joseph Campbell told me, there's like a hero and he gets blocked and you solve something, you know, but that's different here. So I don't know what it means. Like, I don't know how we solve it. I don't know how you actually treat the hero, but it's something to think about. And again, I asked the foreigners and like, you know, it, it goes both ways, but I think in making films and trying to tell stories, there's like respect and understanding of cultures. And when we go to the West for their know-how from China, and we're trying to tell Chinese stories, there's a certain thing that we want from the West. We want the technology, we want the genre, we want this kind of cool zeitgeisty feeling, and we want to apply it to Chinese culture. The Chinese need to understand where like the Westerners come from with the eye and you know the storytelling, the three-act structure and everything. But at the same time, the Westerners need to understand and respect this harmony and guanxi and like how we deal with relationships and things. So this this professor did this study. He took like, it's a smiley face, it's a cartoon, and there's a guy smiling, and then there's six smaller guys in the background, and they're all smiling, so this is a picture. And he holds up the picture to a bunch of Laowai Westerners, and he's like, is that guy happy? And they're like, yeah, he's happy, he's smiling. And then he shows it to a bunch of like Chinese in different Asia areas. He's like, is that guy happy? And he's like, yeah, that guy's happy. Then he takes the same picture of the same guy, and all the people in the background he puts frowns on them all. So the guy in the front has a smile, the guys in the background have frowns. And he shows it to the Westerners, he's like, that guy happy? And he's like, no, or, yeah, he's happy, he's smiling. And he shows the Chinese and the Asian people, is that guy happy? They're like, no, like how can he be happy? The people in the background are happy. And the numbers were like 90%, it's amazing. So like these kind of studies, like this kind of research, like I know for a fact, like there's almost no one's been studying it as far as how it impacts storytelling. Well, I think it's really fascinating. I don't know, you guys are, there are students in here and you guys probably have to do theses and stuff, but I suggest somebody start to research it because there's things that are fascinating in there and I think there's a lot to learn. As our market grows and we need Westerners to make the Chinese films, there's a lot of, it's just know-how, there's a lot of, it's kind of like power. It'll be a lot of like, uh, ability to get other things done if we can figure this out, or whoever can figure this out, I think, uh, will be successful. Um, all right, so, so I've kind of covered some of my suggestions. Um, this goes for Westerners and Chinese, like choose the people you work with closely. Like really try to figure out who you want to work with I've found, like in, you know, in desperation in the early days, trying to get gigs and trying to do things, like you end up wanting the employment more than you really want the quality of something that you're trying to accomplish. And it makes you make bad decisions and stuff. So I think you really need to figure out who you want to work with at all. And the thing to figure out, particularly in China, I think it's a little bit different in the West. We kind of wear, you know, our hearts on our sleeves a little bit. And 
like our goals, I think, are more out there and open. And I think uh, part of the Chinese culture is the goals aren't always as clear. So to me, like if you're a Westerner, like I really recommend trying to get to the bottom of what people really want. So like figure out their goals. And like I think as soon as your goals click, then things go really well here. Like you just need to make sure you find the people that are like really on the same page and really have the same desire for the outcome. And the same goes for Chinese people dealing with the West. I think it's very clear when people are here for monetary reasons and things, and you just need to be able to look at people's characters and try to, to choose your partners for what's important to you. Make sure that it's similar. Um, so again, like I would give the cultures each other a benefit of doubt on trust. Like start from a position of trust. Start from a position of like you assume that your potential partner is competent enough. Track them down, research enough, because trust is either you know it's either character or it's how good you are at something. Like if you're if you're really an honest guy but you suck at it, you can't trust somebody to do the job. If you're like really good but they have bad character, you still can't trust them to do the job. So there's a couple things you really need to focus on against. Are the people competent at what they do? So for the Westerners, are these people competent at making a movie or competent at the thing that you want to partner with? For the Chinese, for the Westerner, you're hiring them for technology. Are they competent at the job you're hiring them for? And both ways, do they have good character? That's the common goals. Um, same thing, think long term. Like again, I think China just works this way. It's uh, it's about long-term relationships and you know trying to do things for the right reason, not just a project base. And then, really, if you're going to work here as a foreigner, you really need to be flexible. You need to adapt because it's very difficult. Like things get thrown up, and because of the chaos of the market, it's always very complicated and difficult to work here. So. Don't think it's going to be otherwise. Assume there's going to be some adapting on your part. I think that's it. That's it for me. Thank you, guys.